Sometimes you have to do something just to show that you can do it. When the Wright brothers flew for the first time, they flew an experimental aircraft. And in the same way, the Mars helicopter is designed to show that we can fly powered helicopter flight in the Martian atmosphere. From day one, this was the unwavering dream of our team, to get our helicopter launched to Mars so that we can get the opportunity to do the very first rotorcraft flight test in the actual environment of Mars. It's extremely difficult to fly at Mars because the atmosphere is so thin. Compared to Earth, at Mars it's less than 1%. So the first and foremost challenge is to make a vehicle that's light enough to be lifted. And then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system has just been very fast. 2,000, 2,200, 2,400. 2600. We're spinning between 2,000 and 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it takes a lot of energy. So it's that balance of a very light system, yet having enough energy that's needed to you know, spin the rotor so fast to lift, and on top of it, having to design in the autonomy. It has to be fully autonomous from the time it takes off to the time it lands. What we do do on the ground is we plan the flights, and so we determine from here where we want the helicopter to go. Our experiment window is 30 Martian days. So we have planned uh, up to five flights of incremental difficulty. The very first flight, the main thing is we want to get the legs off the ground. And so we will basically go up uh, about three meters and we'll hover there uh, and then we'll come down again. And that will be the first, you know, really major milestone. Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. We will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second, probably go out, you know, 50, 70 meters and come back. In successive flights, we'll probably push that further, try to go further. So our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images, but I'm sure we'll return a few, you know, because they'll always look cool. At this point, we've tested all we can on Earth. We have mathematical models that shows how it will fly at Mars, and we've tested it in the simulated environment that we can create on Earth. It really is time now to do the real flight test at Mars. Nothing is a given, but we have done everything we can in terms of a test program here on Earth. The vehicle is performing extremely well so far. It's been doing exactly the right thing, even right now, and it's bolted onto the Perseverance rover. So there's a very good chance that we'll pull it off, yes. But it's still high risk and none of us forget that you could have a glitch that, you know, could mean end of mission, yes. It's going to be exciting, reacting to any surprises we have. We can't wait. <laughs> What's really most important is everything we're learning here is for the future rotorcraft systems that we want to introduce into space exploration. We have deemed Perseverance ready to execute entry, descent, and landing on her own. Confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second, about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. It will start controlling its path to the landing target. Parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration. The heat shield has been separated. Perseverance now has radar lock on the ground. The back shell has separated. Skycam maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. Tango Delta, nominal. Touch on confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars.
Earlier today, Ingenuity should have autonomously performed its first flight attempt on Mars. Now the team is ready to receive the data that will tell them whether we've made history. This is Downlink. We are beginning to see data products. Rotor motors appear healthy. All actuators appear healthy. Ingenuity's reporting having performed spin-up, takeoff, climb, hover, descent, landing, touchdown, and spin down. Altimeter data confirms that Ingenuity has performed its first flight, first flight of a powered aircraft on another planet. Man, I love that video. Uh, it, everything about this is just inspiring for me. So uh, it's incredible. Well, uh, let me move on. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce my friend, uh, Randy Levin. Uh, Randy is the Chief Information Officer and Director for Information and Technology Solutions Directorate for NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, Randy has a BS in Business Administration with a Management information systems degree from the University of Arizona. Um, but I'd like to add a personal note uh, about Randy. Um, Randy is a distinguished, exemplary, and courageous leader. Uh, she's a wonderful person. Uh, and I wanna thank you up front, Randy, uh, for accepting my friendship ever since I approached you so many years ago at a CIO event, like a fan trying to get a selfie with a celebrity. I don't know if you remember that, but I remember that. I do. You were at Paramount. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. That was very kind. Yes. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, everyone to Scott Lewicki. Uh, Scott is the Project Commitments Manager for the IT Solutions Directorate at NASA JPL, and he works for Andy. Uh, Scott's primary role is supporting all the flight projects at JPL, such as Mars 2020. Uh, to make sure that each project is getting the IT infrastructure needed for critical activities. Uh, Scott uh, has a BS in physics from Caltech and has been at JPL for over 34 years. Scott? Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, and then next, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Keith A. Como, PhD, uh, Mars 2020, Deputy Chief Engineer, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, Keith has a storied history that would literally take our entire hour to recount, but in the interest of our short time that we have, let me start with this first question for Keith. Keith? Hey, Kevin. Hey. So, uh, Keith, tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you to pursue this career, uh, this path, this career. Um, yeah, thank, thanks, Kevin. I'm really honored to be here. Um, and happy to see you see you all. The um, I guess going back to my childhood, I've always been interested in math and science, and uh, airplanes in particular um, were very interesting to me. And and I caught the tail end of the Apollo program and, and the Skylab program. So that, as an, in addition to the the startup of the shuttle program um, during my uh, formative years, really kind of inspired me to be an astronaut, actually. And and so I wanted to pursue that dream. And I, I did for quite some time until in college, I learned that my vision was, was less than what the military would take for a, for a fighter pilot. And so that dream was dashed, but um, you know, I think curiosity and perseverance mean a lot to me. That's not just the name of our rovers, but I think that's kind of what led me to the path that I, I'm, I'm on now. Um, I continued with my education, went through, got a PhD in hypersonic aerophysics. Um, you know, the, the stuff that you need to figure out to, to fly at high speeds. Um, but then I took a left turn and went and worked in the satellite industry. Uh, worked on ion propulsion 
um, and uh, communi communication satellites like XM radio and DirecTV. Um, and then JPL knocked on my door and I had a, a unique set of skills at that point in my career. And they asked me to join the Curiosity Entry Descent Landing Team. And uh, that was an opportunity I just couldn't pass up. And so that's been the last 15 years of my life has been working on uh, cool projects like this at, at JPL. And um, I haven't looked back. It's really been a great experience. Wow, that's incredible, Keith. Actually, you know what? You remind me of somewhat of a traumatic event for myself uh, <laughs> when I went to an Air Force recruiter and said I wanted to be a uh, fighter pilot. And he looked at me and said, not with those eyes, you don't. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, I know the I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I didn't I didn't I didn't I, I never got my PhD. So it, did, it didn't have the same motivation for me. I guess. Um, Scott, uh, tell us a bit about your background and what brought you to your career and what brought you to JPL. Um, I, I as Keith kind of mentioned, growing up with a fascination of science and fascination of space. Um, I actually happened to go to, my high school was named after Neil Armstrong. So I think I had no choice but to work for NASA at some point in my life. Um, when I was in high school, I even started a, a science club and built a telescope for my um, high school. Um, it was my, my true fantasy to come and um, to go to school at Caltech. And Caltech, um, operates JPL for NASA. And so there's opportunities to work at JPL while you're a student at Caltech. And I started to work um, on a variety of jobs um, at, at JPL while I was still a student. And uh, the very first, one of the very first projects I worked on was when uh, Voyager went past the planet Neptune. And I was part of the team that was looking at the image data coming from the project um, and I was seeing these images coming from the planet Neptune and the moon Triton. And I realized at that moment that I was probably one of like a couple dozen people on the planet to see these images for the first time. And that was my maybe my second year working at JPL. And I decided this is the place I want to spend my whole career at. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, Randy, tell us a bit about your background, what brought your career and what brought you to um, JPL. Well, I've been doing IT for 35-ish, you know, I don't know, stop counting. Let's just leave it at that, you know, years. And um, I always loved space, you know, at the U of A, I took astronomy and that's a big, you know, one of the big partners of ours is um, U of A and ASU. And uh, I had known Jim in the IT community for, you know, a number of years when he you know, when uh, the search came available for the deputy, and I, I always wanted to work at JPL, and he gave me that opportunity, so I'm forever grateful, and a lot of what we have in place is because of Jim, and so, you know, I want to commend you on that. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, uh, let me move on. Um, so, we included a quote from Harvard Grip, uh, the Mars helicopter chief pilot in our abstra abstract. It's uh, sometimes you have to do something just to show that you can do it. But what was the real goal of the mission? Well, um, <clears throat> that is a, that's a, a really appropriate quote actually. And I'll, I'll say it a different way. Uh, Werner von Braun said something similar. One test is worth a thousand expert opinions. And uh, so basically our, our objective here was to demonstrate that you could in fact fly a helicopter on Mars. Um, we didn't really you know, expand the objectives beyond that because uh, then you, know, you, you probably add too much complexity and you might fail, but this was a technology demonstration mission. Um, our objective was to, to basically lift off and, and uh, execute five flights just to show that we could um, and we've done that. We've executed our five flights. In fact, we've, we've now executed six and we're gonna continue pushing the envelope and uh, just seeing how much this helicopter can do. And with the ultimate objective, as uh, Mimi mentioned in one of those videos is to use this technology on future missions to help scout out and, and explore uh, Mars as well as other places. So um, we achieved the objective. We've demonstrated that it can, in fact, be done. 
cool. We'll 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 talk about uh, the future here in a little bit. But let me ask uh, this next next question in the panel: um, How does JPL make decisions about things the organization has never done before? You know, how did that way of thinking lead JPL in the journey to the successful launch of Mars 2020 and the flight of Ingenuity? Yeah, so let me, I, I think everybody will have something to say about that, but I'll, I'll kick it off. The, um, I think JPL's core business is doing things that have never been done before. You may have seen in one of the videos in the, on the wall, uh, we have this everywhere on the lab, Dare Mighty Things. It's a Teddy Roosevelt quote. And, and that's what we do. We do things that have never been, been done before. And um, you know, that's what makes it so exciting. It also makes it risky. And so you know, we, we accept it and acknowledge that risk. We try to manage that risk, um, but uh, that is the business that we're in. It's amazing. Um, my next question. Did, did Randy, um, Randy might have might have wanted to say. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Well, we do have a strategic plan and we have a strategic, you know, committee that looks at all the various opportunities of what proposals we should be working on, where we should go next, um, not just in planetary, but also in um, earth science. And so it, it goes through a significant process. It's not something that's, you know, taken lightly. And you probably, maybe you all didn't hear, but we just won our last mission yesterday to go back to Venus. <laughs> so one thing I could add to that too is so JPL is responsible for um, performing a number of missions. There's um, maybe three dozen missions that we're operating right now, and there's another uh, dozen missions in the pipeline over the next few years. But it really takes a mission like Mars 2020 that we refer to as a flagship mission that often has the resources, has the team to, you could say, push the envelope. And it's a matter of... So, figuring out the innovations that support these large flagship missions that can then also be utilized by the currently operating missions, and the missions coming in the future. Yeah, and a good example of, of just that is, you know, 20 years ago, actually more than 20 years ago, we, we launched the Mars Pathfinder, which had Sojourner rover on it. And that was our first technology demonstration of a rover on Mars. And so we've pushed that technology, you know, decade after decade to the point that we now have uh, curiosity and perseverance. And so looking down the road, uh, this helicopter demonstration can hopefully lead to the same sorts of uh, innovations. Man, the work you all do is uh, just incredible. But let me ask this question. What were the greatest challenges to overcome for this particular uh, innovation? So, um, for ingenuity, so Mimi touched on it in, in some of her uh, discussion. It was really just an over-constrained problem. Um, the Martian atmosphere is so thin that in order to develop lift in that thin atmosphere, you know, it's like flying at 100,000 feet here on Earth. Um, we really had to push the technology on those rotor blades, not only in the speed of the blades, which she alluded to, but also in the, in the, in the design and construction of those blades or carbon fiber uh, blades. They're very light. I mean, you would, if you pick them up, you would, you would see how light they are. So um, keeping the weight down on, um, on the helicopter was very important. And then energy was the other uh, really fundamental constraint, um, not only for flying, but also for keeping the helicopter warm, especially overnight. Uh, we spend most of our battery power actually uh, operating heaters, so the helicopter doesn't freeze overnight. So there are many uh, technical constraints that we had to uh, overcome, and not the least of which was how do we put this on the rover and safely deploy it uh, from the rover without presenting a risk to the rover itself, uh, not only during landing, but also driving if it would get stuck or something of that nature. So. There were, there were many different uh, challenges that we had to, to overcome during the course of uh, that development. Yeah, but it's incredible to actually see your brainstorming boards when you guys are out there you know, <laughs> up there trying to figure these things out. Um, was automation used along the way to provide you know, scale, efficiency, effectiveness, you know, when and how? Um, so certainly uh, for anything that we do on Mars, um, it's essentially automated. We do not have real-time contact 
with our rovers or um, even spacecraft at Mars. And so we have to design in the smarts, uh, the brains, the autonomy, the fault protection in the computers themselves to operate without human intervention. Um, even if we could, inter if we had the resources to intervene, the, the, the time it takes for a signal to reach Mars and then return back to Earth can be anywhere from uh, six to 30 minutes, depending on where Mars and Earth are um, in their orbits. And uh, that's just not a time constant that you know, humans in the loop can really support. And so everything that we do at Mars is, is with autonomy. The helicopter in particular, um, all of those flights had to be uh, autonomous. Uh, you maybe saw in the video, some of the uh, early tests that we did were kind of couldn't get off the ground or stay stable. You know, those were human in the loop tests where somebody was trying to joystick it. Mm. And uh, their response times are just too fast. Um, but there are many examples of, of automation um, for example, you know, the pictures that we send, that we take on Mars and then we transmit through our relays and then come down to the deep space, network, deep space network, they get pushed automatically to the cloud and uh, they are available to the general public within uh, tens of minutes, if not uh, sooner from the moment that they reach Earth. And so that's a process, another process that we've automated to basically get those those images out as fast as we can to all the scientists to support us from around the world. Um, mm -hmm. So there's there's so many examples I could cite, and maybe um, Scott or Randy could could cite a few more. Well, I was going to talk about the cloud, but you already alluded to that. So Scott, any anything else that you want to add on? Yeah. So there's a, a lot of the um, even the compute the the networks that were built out to support the mission are um, following on from previous missions and each one is built more to scale. I mean, some of the things that Keith was mentioning that um, the need for the science team to turn around very quickly, the ability to generate commands that then get sent to the rover or the helicopter and to develop the science planning behind that. So how the group of scientists that look at the data so far and decide where they wanna go next all of those processes are laid out, automated, optimized, and for the first time, use the cloud very significantly for a, a major mission like this. Um, it, so, uh, you know, it's incredible. So, you know, I, it, it seems to me like a lot of the work, the human work goes up front, right? And there's a lot of planning and collaboration and engineering that you have to do. Um, what have you uh, learned about how to structure teams for initiatives like this in order to support innovation, expeditious but thoughtful decision-making and the right amount of communication and information sharing? Well, I'll start. I'll say that, you know, we have cross-functional teams that come together. Um, the, the, the amazing thing at JPL is that if there's an issue with anything, you know, in the planning or, you know, once it's operating, you know, we get the best available people together, you know, the best brains and they just jump on it and solve problems. And um, it's a, it's highly collaborative in that way. And I don't think we could do our missions any other way. And it, it doesn't matter whose organization they're in or what they've been working on, people just jump on the problem. So Keith, yeah, I mean, I would agree. There's, it's a very open and collaborative uh, organization. Sometimes, you know, very honest too, and you know that honesty comes out. Um, you know, when when there's issues that need to be worked, we 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 have to work them. Our missions really depend on that, um, you know, technical excellence, and and we have to find the flaw, as it were, and uh, and fix the issues that could um, hurt us down the road. Yeah. Um, I, I'd also say, you know, from the from the engineering point of view, design, designing our systems, you know, we try as best we can to to align our organizations around the interfaces and deliverables that we make, so that we can, you know, more efficiently divide our teams, and so they can kind of work largely independently and really focus our interactions around the interfaces. Sometimes we're we're good at that. Sometimes the the complexity is just really high and that's that's when you really have to, to pay attention to the collaboration and make sure that we're all talking uh, the same language and are on the same page yeah 
Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll definitely add to that what Keith is saying, the same language. So one thing that you might imagine is that the, the scientists, engineers on a mission, the training, the way that they implement things is different than the IT directorate at JPL. It's almost as if there's two different communities speaking a different language. And so a role that I play and others play are, are almost like translators. I can, I can speak the language of the flight project and then translate that back into what is the IT and infrastructure that they need. Then our directorate is also uniquely placed in that we're supporting multiple missions. So if, if Mars 2020 is having an issue with some type of infrastructure that, that they need to support them, it might be a problem that's been already solved by some other support that we've provided to another mission that we can then take that solution and apply it across multiple, uh, multiple groups. So we're kind of centrally positioned to provide that kind of support. Yeah, I, I'll just, I wanna share a story here. On, on launch day uh, last year, um, we we're going through the countdown. It was very early in the morning. Of course, we were launching from Florida, but 20 minutes before launch, we experienced an earthquake here uh, nearby Pasadena. I forget, I think it was San Gabriel, but it was very close to, to JPL and it shook us up. We were, we were startled by it. It wasn't, it was close enough that, you know, the building shook and we're 20 minutes away from launch and uh, we'd never trained for that. We'd never prepared, didn't have a checklist. And Scott and his team were actually in the building with us and we could actually talk with them directly to confirm that all of our systems were still operational and that we could proceed with the launch countdown. That was, that was a really great moment for us, I think. Wow. And then let's add that and it was in the middle of the pandemic and, you know, we only had, uh, you know, the, the most essential people on lab and I was home and I thought, did anything fall over, you know, and I'm on the phone with Scott and a few others did, you know, is everything still working? It was, there was such, you know, you add all of these other elements in that were just never present before really, you know, and, you know, at one point in time and, I think it shows the resiliency also of our organization to just bounce back in terms of all this adversity. Yeah, yep, yeah. for sure. You guys touched on a, a, a lot of this already, but I want to ask if we can dig a little deeper into the, the, the process, what the process is like for attaining cross-departmental buy-in where help is needed from groups outside of engineering, like communications, IT, HR, other engineering groups, what have you. Well, Keith, you go first because you're the customer. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think there's a, a very linear process in that I think most organizations have is, is when, when you need support um, and the resources aren't there or, or, or the, the folks that are supporting you are over, over subscribed, you escalate it, right? So we, we escalate it through our project management and, and they go to the, you know, to the lab and that's where Randy gets involved in those situations when her organization is involved. But um, um, I, I, that, that's the starting point, I think, for resolving issues that we have of that nature. But, you know, in general, though, uh, again, I think our collaboration is pretty strong. And, you know, we don't go directly up the chain when we have an issue. We try to work with our counterparts initially to, to find compromises and, and solutions. Um, that work for both of us in that context. We, we also collaborate very closely with our vendor partners because they're you know essential to our ecosystem, and so um, they were right there with us you know during you know takeoff and then during landing. Um, the the other thing was you know in terms of collaboration, we had a lot of collaboration going on with our communications organization because of all of the external communication. And it was more than actually it normally was. Normally we would have an event like this on our lab, but it was a pandemic. So that was just much more of a skeleton crew. And the Biden administration were very, was very interested in what um, was going on. And so the communications department didn't have the bandwidth to be able to really handle all of that. So we jumped in and we became the other communications department dealing with, um, you know, we got Zoom involved and we did some Zooms with the White House and with Congress and, you know, with other entities. And that was just, um, 
you know, and, and then that would involve getting people from the mission also to help participate. So Keith or somebody like Keith to participate in that and the communications. So it was truly an all hands on deck experience. Yeah. yeah. And, and the only thing I could add to that, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead Scott. Oh, I was gonna talk about the helicopter. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, I'll say real quick, because that thing to recognize too is missions like this take years. Um, uh, Keith, you can say when this first was um, um, first proposed as a mission and how long it took from that to get to launch. And throughout that, the different departments at JPL, especially the um, you know, department that, that we lead in IT um, solutions and infrastructure, we're partnered with the mission. We're kind of, we're connected at the hip and understanding what they need at different points along the development of that mission all the way up to launch. Yep. And so, and just taking a different perspective on, you know, getting buy-in across um, various teams, I think uh, in the 2020 um, Perseverance Ingenuity example, <clears throat> there's a couple of different uh, cross-functional um, adversaries, shall I say, uh, that are just naturally part of the system, science and engineering, uh, their objectives and, and risk posture might be a little bit different. So we're always, scientists always wanna to go to the, the most cool, interesting places, which are all, also the most dangerous places to drive a rover into. And so there's always kind of that tension. So that is, that is one of the interfaces that we really um, pay attention to closely. And we have lots of meetings with the, in the engineers and scientists at the project level to make sure that we're all moving forward in the same direction. And the same, same story with the helicopter. The helicopter was actually a late addition to the Mars 2020 project. Um, and uh, it, it had been in development as a technology demonstration for a very long time, but didn't really have a mission to fly on until uh, NASA decided it would fly on, on 2020. So it was a late ad. A lot of folks on the 2020 project were, um, you know, they struggled with, you know, why it had to be on 2020 and, and it would add risk to the 2020 project. And so we had to work through all of those interfaces and challenges to make sure that, you know, we were all motivated to um, make it a success. And, and of course it was. Absolutely. Um, let me ask this question. Are, do you, are there any commercial uses uh, for the innovations you've created with uh, Ingenuity? So, um, you know, that's an interesting question. I think the commercial uses we've probably already have seen and, and we're catching up with, with some of those applications on Mars. Drones are, are everywhere now. You see them in, in you know, Super Bowl halftime celebrations flying in the air in formation with lights and everything. Um, so I, I think we're, we're catching up. Certainly the new technology here is the miniaturization uh, and, and application at, at Mars atmosphere pressures. Um, I can't think off the top of my head what, what that could be used for here on earth, the high altitude uh, uh, drones perhaps, um, maybe for mountain rescues and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I, I think autonomy in our everyday lives is, is already moving at a pretty fast play, pace with, uh, with autonomous cars. Um, and I don't know if we're going to have another question coming up, but one of the challenges there with autonomy is, is anticipating all of the different use cases that you might encounter with that automation. And mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, that is also um, a big challenge that maybe we'll learn something from, from Mars and how to apply that to Earth. Cool, cool. All right, I've got two more questions and then we'll uh, try to save some time to take some questions from the audience. Um, my next question is, uh, what are new challenges that will have to be solved as missions like the flight of ingenuity become more the norm? Uh, what are the big lessons that enterprises can take away from this experience, your experience? Sure, we all have different answers to this question. You know, I, I look at cybersecurity and the security of, you know, all of our missions that way going forward as being, you know, a paramount concern that we've got to build in cyber um, defenses, you know, into our designs at the inception, not just, you know, the detective controls or, you know, remediation. Okay. 
So Keith or Scott, you guys have anything to, to say? Um, <clears throat> well, I think, I mean, I think the lesson for, for me and, you know, the engineering um, aspects of it is, you know, we can take risks and be successful at them um, if we manage those risks well, if we understand uh, what they are and, you know, apply the right resources to, to address them. Um, you know, these, as I said earlier, you know, dare mighty things, we do take risks where those risks are worth taking. And I think, uh, you know, adding ingenuity to the perseverance mission, while it may have increased a little bit the risk of, of a successful landing and for potentially driving around on Mars. Mm -hmm. It was a risk worth taking and, and we addressed all of the, uh, the risks that it presented to the Perseverance mission to make sure that um, that ingenuity was successful. So I think there's a lesson there that we can do more of these technology demonstration missions uh, on these flag flagship missions. Yeah. Kevin? Yes. I wonder if I could add a little bit to uh, uh, that one thing about this particular mission is it um, had curiosity before it. And so some of the reuse of the engineering and some of the technology made the risk, made the mission a little less risky, not totally less risky, but, uh, and that really helped. Uh, but it did have all new instruments on it, if, if I got that right, Keith, and plus, plus the uh, helicopter. And then my second question was going to be, Keith, our statement was uh, just, the, can you describe how the helicopter talks to uh, okay. and communicates with the rover and explain that technology and then how we get the images from the rover to, to Earth? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a relay race, really. The, the helicopter has its own um, communication system. Um, where the helicopter itself has a radio and then there's a base station radio on the rover. And so the helicopter and the rover can talk with one another. Um, and then we also have uh, relays, uh, orbital um, satellites around Mars that uh, collect all of the science and engineering data from Perseverance and then uh, relay them back to the Deep Space Network. Um, so there's a handoff there. So we only get to talk with the helicopter at most once a day. We have a comm session that, uh, that is kind of on a, a timer. And so every, uh, every afternoon we talk with the, uh, the helicopter and we are either, either downloading the data from a previous flight or uploading the next set of commands for the next flight. Um, and uh, we're doing that on, on a daily basis with the rover and the helicopter. Let me just say it's amazing to me figuring out the risk of doing something that you've never done before and in doing it over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, we build and and Jim is absolutely right. We build on the successes of our past. We were still reusing technology from the, the Mars Viking missions in the 1970s. Yeah. And so it, it's working. So we keep using it. Yeah. So uh, great segue. So speaking of building on successes, um, where does the future of RoboCraft go from here? What's the future? What are the future uses plan for Ingenuity or any other RoboCraft that uh, JPL is going to build? So um, we're already doing it. Actually, we completed our 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 technology demonstration of five flights, and um, you know that was a really limited set of uh, of flights. There was no science objective whatsoever. Um, we were not using that to feed forward into our science campaign, but the flights went so well and the pictures that have come back are so intriguing that now I think we have a little bit more interest in using or at least demonstrating how the helicopter could be used as a scout to help inform how our science progresses on the surface of Mars. And so it's really uh, kind of rewarding to see that come to fruition. I think... Um, our, the cadence of our flights are going to uh, drop down um, quite a bit, maybe once or twice a month. But um, we're going to actually see if we can put the, the helicopter to use to inform how we, um, we operate on Mars. And so that's kind of the, the model going forward for future missions is bringing these drones along uh, to help scout out for, uh, for rover missions and uh, 
probably human missions at some time in the future as well. Cool. Uh, Keith, could you speak generally about also the Mars Sample Return Program? Oh, you betcha. So that's my next job, actually, and that'll be a, a 10 year venture at least. Um, so Perseverance is actually the first step of bringing rock samples back from Mars to Earth. So Perseverance has a, a caching system, um, a robotic arm with a coring drill. We're gonna drill into rocks and, and take samples, um, uh, analyze those samples, seal them in essentially titanium test tubes, sample tubes that we'll leave on the surface of Mars for the next mission to uh, go and retrieve. And so the sample return, the next leg of that sample return mission is a lander that will carry both a, a fetch rover, which will go fetch the samples that Perseverance leaves behind, as well as a Mars ascent vehicle, basically a rocket that will blast off from Mars with those samples and, and place uh, the sample canister in orbit around Mars for a third mission uh, built by the Europeans, the Earth Return Orbiter, to go in orbit around Mars, uh, find and retrieve those samples, um, to grab them and put them in an uh, entry vehicle that it will then fly back to Earth and that entry vehicle will drop in to uh, a test range in Utah. So that whole uh, campaign is, is about a decade in, in the works. Um, and 2031 is, is when we expect to have those samples back. Wow. Um, I hope I'm around to see that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're making good time. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, so um, if uh, you don't mind, I'd like to open the Zoom session to questions from our audience. Um, uh, there's so many people here. I don't know if I'm going to be able to be able to necessarily keep it orderly. So let me just open it up and uh, the first to speak, ask your question. Is Laurent out there? Laurent actually sent me a question. Oh, I, I think uh, Professor Abe raised his hand. Professor Abe. No, I'm sorry. There you are. There you go. Uh, thank you. Um, I know Keith Como got an MBA at UCLA. Yeah, I. And I he got it well after he got his PhD. So, what motivated you to get your MBA, and what do you use it for at GPL? <laughs> good, to, good to see you, George. Yeah, thanks for yeah. remembering. Um, I was in George's uh, entrepreneurship class. Um, the uh, yeah, so I was actually at Boeing um, in, on a on a career path of uh, project management, program management. Uh, and my wife and I, um, who is at AT and T now, uh, were both interested in pursuing an MBA at that time. It was certainly something that. Um, Made a lot of sense working for a commercial company like Boeing, and um, and uh, right as I started the program, I actually made the switch to JPL. So oh. <laughs> the finance part of it didn't make as much sense anymore. But I think there's still a lot of um, really good nuggets that I took away from the the project for from the EMBA program. Um, human resources and just understanding more of the softer side of, of management, I think was a really important thing for me to take away from that pro program, as well as, you know, the operations aspect of things. How do you make an, an organization efficient and, and uh, we're working on all cylinders? Those were, I think, two very big takeaways that I had. I don't deal with money so much um, anymore, certainly not in a for-profit sense. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly made good use of your MBA, I can say. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, George. <laughs> uh, well, Keith, I, I have to say there's, there's something to be said about uh, the value of being a life lifelong learner, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I enjoyed that aspect of it probably more than anything. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Seems we already answered Laurent's uh, question, but is there anyone else? Yeah, I have a question. 
unless someone else has one. Is it okay to go? Go ahead, yeah, go, go ahead. for it. Okay, yeah, so I do, do want to say thank you for the wonderful session. Definitely learned a lot. I'm also in Professor Abe's class, actually, at this, this moment, this mm -hmm. time. Um, so this is actually a personal thing. Like my, my son is in high school and I did take him to your center a, a few times this is a few years ago when he was in middle school trying to teach him because he's like, he's very interested in the STEM. And, and, I'm, and I went back and looked in, to see how, what else is offered from JPL for like high school students at this point, because I feel like, you know, by the time the kids get to, let's say they, they join Caltech or they get to know about some of the, you know, technologies, I feel like you know, for them to acquire that knowledge to even know they're going to like it and get there. Uh, I just want to see if there's something available at high school level or where, you know, maybe JPL is offering something where you teach them so they get exposed and then they actually can maybe pursue it further because I feel like some kids miss out on these wonderful opportunities and, you know, it takes them quite a bit of time but by the time they actually get to your place or, yeah, so. We have an education department and there is, you know, education available at all levels. I will say that, you know, this time during the pandemic, which was um, so unique in, in so many ways, we did a lot more outreach for all age groups. We even did a Zoom event on, on this, you know, geared towards middle school students in Puerto Rico. We did one, we did one, we, we did multiple, you know, uh, outreach and education sessions. So. But, you know, like right now, we really don't have internships for high school students because we have so many college students that want internships. And so it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to balance, but STEM education is a huge thing for us. Um, you know, and if, if you'd like, we can go back and get more information on what all of those programs are and I can give it to, to Rafi to disseminate. Yeah, that'll, that'll be great. Thank you. And I would, I would also suggest that, you know, things like FIRST Robotics um, might be something that, uh, you know, children can, can, can get engaged in, um, even before high school, actually. Um, and that's a really good introduction, I think, into um, not only the technology, um, but also, you know, working in teams. And, you know, that is a big part of what we do. Something I never really appreciated when I was going through school, you know, everything was um, homework sets, you know, doing, doing problem sets and everything kind of on an individual basis. But you know, looking back on my education, I think those team experiences, I think were really important. And, you know, that's, we, we can't do anything as complex and as significant as, as what we do at JPL without being part of a larger team. So I would, I'd recommend something like first robotics and also, um, the, uh, the path to JPL is not necessarily linear. It took me 15 years to get there out of college. So um, I think, uh, you know, anything's possible, so. I have one, Kevin, if that's all right. Yes. So NASA JPL, uh, particularly regarding Mars, has this huge success of continuing missions beyond the plan. And I would love to hear a little bit more. You talked about, you know, now we're gonna use ingenuity to explore for science purposes, but talk maybe about how from an improv and innovation perspective, you guys deal with that. Cause I think that's amazing. Yeah, and I presume you're, you're also kind of thinking back to our past rover missions that lasted far, out, far outlasted their expected lifetime. Um, yep. Yeah, and I, I kind of think about that in terms of like the, the warranty that you have on your car. Um, you know, it's gonna expire. Uh, the, the dealership pretty much tells you that the, the car is gonna last through that period of time. And then, and then what happens after is no longer their responsibility. But um, we, we design and, and test our systems to meet a certain expected lifetime. And that lifetime is consistent with the requirements that we flow down to the, to the mission. Uh, for the mission objectives um, but and, and that keeps the cost down right because to test something and prove that it's going to work for 10 years is a very difficult thing to do very expensive thing to do so we we do we demonstrate that it's going to last in perseverance's case it's going to last for three years three earth years um, but 
there's margin in everything that we, we build and that margin pays off in, in many cases. And um, I, think, uh, I think that's what you're saying. And so we, as long as we have a working uh, asset on Mars, um, you know, it doesn't make any sense to turn it off and never use it again. So that's how we keep our missions going. You know, as, as long as they're still returning science and returning value to the community, uh, NASA, I think, is uh, motivated to keep them operational. And, and Doug, I will add, you know, we still are flying Voyager, yeah. you know, and, and that was in the 70s. And so um, it presents a whole bunch of unique challenges for us the further we go back, because that's built on old, old, old technology. And I'll just share a really quick story, but we had to move um, Voyager and it's all of its compute out of a facility into another one. And, you know, most of the people that wrote that no longer around, you know, documentation like we did. We didn't have the source code in some ways. What did we call it? An archeological re restructuring of the code to be able to, there was some word that they came up with, which I thought was highly unique to be able to rewrite it so that we could actually move it out of the building because we were we no longer were leasing that building. So um, it presents really a lot of unique IT challenges because we don't just have one of those, we have a lot of those. So um, I'm not saying that there's one answer here. I'm just saying that it's very challenging. So, you know, we do a great job engineering and it seems to, you know, it seems to go much longer than in some cases than we anticipated. So we have to get better at being able to come up with how are we going to maintain it? And we're working on that together with the missions. Even reinventing it, it sounds like that's, that's, thank you so much. That's such a great answer. Yeah. Still flying Voyager. So I'm still expecting one of these days Voyager will return as V'ger, I guess. It is, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, is it Jayanti? Am I pronouncing the name right? Oh yeah, I already uh, asked my question. No, I know you did. I'm, I wanted to add a little bit. I wanted to plug oh. Burbank uh, Library. Uh, we have a robotics open house every year and it includes uh, competitors of the first robotics competition. Okay. Yeah, know. actually my son yeah. was part of uh, first robotics a while ago and, but, and, and I know high schools have that too. Yeah. Great program and they have the WEX. So definitely following all that. Yeah. yeah, thank you for all the recommendations. Sure. I'll add one more. Um, we, we used to run the annual invention challenge for high school teams. We didn't do it last year, I, I imagine, because of the pandemic. But I would imagine that we will reconvene, you know, probably this coming year. I don't know how far along your, your son is in his high school tenure, but um, he may yeah. be able to participate. No, I'm also trying to coordinate it with for other kids as well. So like, I'm like kind of a parent who's trying to also help other kids. So, uh, so I'll be interested. I'll definitely reach out to you and, and you know, try to get a, all the programs and see what I could do for my school. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Any other questions? I think we've made wonderful time. Um, I want to thank Randy and Scott and Keith. Jim and everybody who's attended the event uh, today. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Everybody. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye, guys. Take care.